where journalists used to be um, really respected and taken care of in foreign lands um, and protected, now they're truly targets. It's a whole new danger and you are never safe. It's, it's a huge difference. My name is Claudine Kent, and I'm visiting from Portland, Oregon, United States. I actually knew David my entire life. We grew up in the same neighborhood, and then he went off and began this amazing career, and I went off and, and did my thing, and then in 2013, he moved back to Portland. He became my everything. He was my best friend, my soulmate, my rock, my cheerleader. He was my boy's inspiration, um, and he was my future. David's heart, soul, was a photojournalist. And when we first got together, I knew that if I was going to be in a relationship with him, I had to accept that this is who he was because it's what made him and it's what made him special. You know, if I'd asked him to ever stop or not continue, you'd been taking his self away. And so it really was who he was and he was driven in ways that I don't think most of us can understand or explain. I had not seen him in 20 years and he was a completely different human being from when I had known him when he was younger. He was worldly and he was fascinating and he was interesting and I could learn the world through him. He had covered just about everything. He started out in his career um, doing sports. Um, so he did the whole sports gamut for a couple of years. Then he really got into wanting to travel, explore the world, share um, events and conflicts that were happening around the world. And he had some opportunities to start doing that. One of his first big trips was covering apartheid. He just found himself kind of natural at covering conflicts. As a child, he was that fearless, risk-taking child that terrified parents. And as an adult, as a photojournalist, that served him well because where most people would be too afraid, he went towards danger instead of pulling back. And he was just a natural with his talent and his courage and curiosity and passion and dedication to share with the world what was happening in places that most of us would never see or experience. It's kind of funny in going through his childhood toys. He has news cameras, he has an Olympic van um, with news cameras attached, he has um, you know lots of combat, G.I. Joe type guys. I mean from a childhood when you look back, you can see that he was meant to do this work. Once he figured out that he was really talented at photography, it really gave him focus and direction. But he grew up with a dark room in his house and spent a lot of time with his dad in the dark room learning how to develop film. And he spent a lot of time just going through his dad's photo books. David would just have quiet time that his parents wouldn't even really be aware that he was down looking at photographs or sneaking into the dark room because he was only supposed to go in there with his dad. But he was drawn to it. And the thing that's kind of fascinating is David was adopted. If you look at David's dad's photographs and then you look at David's, it's really hard to believe there's not a DNA link. Just the innate talent um, was just within David. He was an artist. He wasn't just a photojournalist. I mean, he was truly an artist and considered himself a photographer first, and then the journalism followed thereafter. He loved a lot about his job. He loved the sense of adrenaline and ad adventure. He loved connecting with the people and getting to know not just the natural disaster, or the war conflict, but the humans behind what was happening. 
He explained to me once that once you experience that, you just want to keep going back. It's not like you put the camera to your face and therefore it makes what you're seeing okay, but certainly you can put yourself in a zone. It's, it's I am doing this and what I'm doing is, is not pleasant, but you just, you march through it. I mean, it's, it's hard, but you can't get caught up in it and become part of it. You still need to maintain your state of mind that you are helping tell this story. And then he loved working with his colleagues, and he had many that he worked with over and over again, and his colleagues were friends and were family. I think a lot of people saw him as fearless, but he acknowledged the dangers. He loved Afghanistan. He'd been the first photojournalist to hit the ground in Iraq and had spent years in Iraq during um, the conflict and then immediately went into Afghanistan. It became his second home. It became his passion. He had Afghanistan rugs and art in his home. It was some place that he felt truly really at home. He was always very reassuring when he would go. He would always say, it's not as dangerous as they make it out to be. It's okay, I'll be okay, I'll be safe. He would convince his loved ones, he would convince his colleagues, because oftentimes he was with colleagues that were terrified. So he kind of took on that persona to comfort everyone else. But deep down, he just believed in it. You can't really explain how somebody can keep putting themselves in harm's way and sleeping in horrible conditions and you know not bathing for six weeks at a time and being in 120 degree heat and dehydrated and gunfire coming at you and you just can't explain why somebody would keep putting themselves into those situations unless it's just who they are. One of the amazing things about being embedded and working with U.S. forces and sometimes other other countries, uh, ISAF, which is the international forces, but but mainly U.S. forces is who we embed with. But um, is just how intimate you are with the subject. I mean, he definitely knew that um, because of the Taliban, now ISIS, and internal conflicts that it was an extremely dangerous place and where journalists used to be really respected and taken care of in foreign lands and protected, now they're truly targets. It's a whole new danger. You are never safe. It's, it's a huge difference. David felt a lot of pressure with being a photojournalist, especially in the last few years. David, the years that we were together, was um, very concerned about job stability. So it doesn't really matter how many awards you've won. Um, he would say, I'm as good as my last award. And for him, the awards and accolades didn't mean anything other than job security. He thought it was horrible that he could win an award and get national attention for human suffering. One of the main reasons the Ebola epidemic is out of control here, the corpses. Teams from the health department can't pick them up fast enough. These men belong to one of only four body collection teams that work in Liberia's capital of Monrovia. With the way the world is now, the expense um, and cost of sending journalists into these conflict zones, there's an increasing pressure to produce great photographs, um, interesting stories, and so there's a tremendous amount of pressure on these journalists when they go into these areas that it needs to be worth the news organization's money. And um, there's some tough calls sometimes. David suffered from PTSD. That wasn't recognized by his employers. And on this trip, he was struggling. He was being triggered, and so he knew himself that um, he wasn't in a good place, and he voiced to me and to his editor that he um, was considering coming home. David never, ever talked about leaving a job assignment. It was unbelievable when he threatened to come home, and I really believed in my heart and soul he was going to be told to come home. So after this trip to Afghanistan, 
we learned a lot that we didn't know before during the trip, and it really pointed out how different it truly was based on this team making decisions that didn't follow standard protocol. The producer was very nervous about um, going out on this patrol and voiced her concerns, and she was with two veteran the correspondent and David, the photojournalist, were veterans at this. They wanted to get out and do the story and convinced her um, to take this risk. And on this trip, they sat at a town hall um, for three and a half hours with the leaders of um, this massive conflict um, all in one spot. And so they were sitting targets. Um, trusting the general that the road was clear for this patrol is not normal, isn't standard to trust Afghans on the ground. The team just wasn't behaving um, with good thought process, and I don't know if it was because of the pressure um, or why they took the risks that they took. They were there to show that the Afghan troops were managing the Taliban and were making progress. The general wanted to take them out on this patrol to show that they had cleared this area and it was safe, which it obviously wasn't. So they were there to tell a story that didn't really exist. The Afghan troops aren't beating the Taliban and they're not taking control of the region. We're staying with them, we're sleeping with them, we're eating with them, and we're going on patrol with them every day. So that is a very unique look, as if we spin back to what we were talking about early on in the conversation, it's, it's, a, it's a look that you, ha you only get by going there. And that's how we can say, look, we know for a fact that the Afghans are doing this by themselves this year or last year as it was, and they'll be doing it again this year, they're, they're really in the lead because we went out and we took the time and fortunately were invited in to a space where most people aren't to see what they're doing and how they're doing. David's last hours in Afghanistan um, are a little unclear. You have to get to the point where you resolve yourself, you'll most likely never really know what happened um, since you're doing with the Taliban. The FBI has been involved since day one. What I know is that um, the journalist team was sitting at this town hall meeting and somebody at the meeting called ahead to the Taliban to say that journalists were going to be coming through and they were waiting for them. There were two vehicles going down the path that had journalists, um, and the front car was with the general, and um, they made it to safety. But David's and Zabi's vehicle with um, a missile of some sort, there's a little bit of dispute of what kind of weapon hit the vehicle. The most upsetting um, details that came out after the initial reports was that Zabi was found outside of the vehicle with a single gunshot and didn't have his protective vest on. The facts are upsetting. Um, like I said, there's different little differences of stories coming out. At the end of the day, I know that David's autopsy report um, that was done in the United States by the military was his cause of death, was blast injuries. David had a fake flower in his hand. We're guessing that it was, you know, something that was hanging in the Humvee, and it was clenched in his hand, and the coroner said that's a good indication that he was killed instantly because it wasn't released. He was actually clenching it instead of it being released. It's interesting because David wore was known for wearing silver bracelets on his wrists that he would gather around the world. And he wore about six or seven normally, and he had shared a story that whenever he'd have a close call, he would take one of his silver bracelets and toss it into a body of water. And when I got his belongings home, one bracelet came back. 
His cameras were destroyed. They were eventually recovered, um, but they can't get any photographs off of them, so there's no pictures, if he took pictures, to say what might have happened in those final moments. I really don't know about his, um, his final hours, because it was him and Zabi in a vehicle together, and neither of them are here to share what happened, and the other two journalists that were in another vehicle couldn't see their vehicle. Um, they really have no idea. It was hours and hours before their bodies were brought back so they really don't know what happened in that time frame either. I found out about David's death from a friend texting me to say, I'm so sorry to hear about David. I was on my way to meet his parents at the time I got this text, and I just, I couldn't process it because in my gut, I knew something was wrong. I had sent him a text right about the time of his death that I said, um, are you safe and bored? Or are you in the middle of something exciting and in danger? And I didn't hear back from him. And I just had this sick feeling. I just, my gut just, I couldn't focus. I couldn't do anything. I just knew something was wrong. And so I, when I got this text, it confirmed what was going on in my gut, but I couldn't process it because I was supposed to be the person that was contacted. So there's no way this could, could be true. And I immediately just started screaming to my children to turn on the TV turn on the computer, and I was hysterical. And screaming at them and on the computer was the famous picture that um, was later shown everywhere with the headline of him being killed. It was the worst moment of my life. And then my first concern was, what about his parents? Like, do they know? How would they know? And so I drove over to their house, and when his mom opened the door, I saw his sister in their apartment and I could see David's dad and I knew they knew just by their faces. Um, and David's mom had gotten an email and she'd gotten an email from Human Resources that said, you need to call us, it's about David. And I was keeping her posted of where they were and what they were doing. Um, David was very careful to never tell his mother what he was doing, but I would share. And so she knew as soon as she got that email. And so she called their human resources department. It wasn't anybody that knew David. It wasn't the CEO. It was somebody in the human resources department that told her that her son had been killed in Afghanistan. We created the David P. Gilkey Foundation to create an awareness um, for the public. David's mother and I realized that we took a lot of things for granted. So her and I learned that if we are ignorant to what these journalists are facing because these journalists are protecting their families and loved ones from knowing, then the greater community world has no idea either. And so once something like this happens to you, people that similar things have happened reach out as well. You just learn that you're not alone in this. Other families have experienced this same tragic loss. We really want to um, create a public awareness that journalists are under attack. They are targets. They aren't wanted and welcomed in these conflicts, and they're a threat to the truth getting out. We want another family to know um, if something happens to their loved one, that everything was followed um, to make sure that everything was looked at, um, that they assessed the risk appropriately, and it was a team of people that decided the risk reward made sense. I can only um, relay what David used to say. David was um, at somewhat of a frustrating place in his career when he was asked to speak with college students a lot. David knew what it was like to be that college student desperately wanting to be a photojournalist. And he actually has a journal from his first year in college where he writes in his journal how this is his dream and how quickly can I get there. And you can just read the passion and desire he had um, when he was in college. So he very much related to these eager, ambitious college students. He had a hard time kind of saying, yeah, go for it. 
you know? It's not glamorous. You don't make a lot of money. It's hard, hard, both emotionally and physically taxing work. David's body, after doing this for 30 years in the film, bad back, bad knees, he'd been blown out of a vehicle, so his ears, his eyes, his brain had all literally been damaged. It takes a true toll on the human body. The more time you can spend with your subjects before you need to either photograph them or interview them, the more candid it's going to be. <clears throat> I'll tell you in the case of war, um, it's simple. The minute you go out with them and you get shot at or blown up, you're in. <laughs> so he walked a fine line. He tried to tell them the realities, but not discourage them if it was their dream and passion. It's not just reporting, it's not just taking pictures, it's do those products, do the visuals, do the stories, do they change somebody's mind enough to, to take action. So if we're doing our part, you know, it gets people to do their part, hopefully. Journalists who work in conflict zones are rare humans. They are very aware of the extreme dangers but feel compelled to share the plight of others with the world. Their selfless dedication and profound sacrifices are a gift to the world. The journalists aren't doing this work for fame or awards. They do it because they want to make a positive contribution to society. David was a loving and dedicated son, friend, and mentor to many. His sacrifice to give his life to share the truth and the realities with the world must have a greater meaning. It's a shame it takes losing a brilliant photojournalist to create change and awareness, but it is our mission to keep journalists as trained and educated and safe as possible. News organizations have a responsibility to adhere to safety protocols, train editors, not only in the field, but also those behind the scenes in the office. They need to provide proper life insurance for those journalists that are covering conflict zones. As David said, it's a different world to cover since 9-11. You no longer can always see the enemy. Journalists are now targets. David and Zabi did not die in the middle of a war. The Taliban was waiting for them and they were murdered. <laughs>